David Zeritsky for the Bond Experience. Welcome back. I am here with my good friend. How are you doing today? Very well. Lovely to see you. Please introduce yourself and what you do here. My name is Paul Spires. I'm the uh, president of Aston Martin Works here at Newport Pagnell in England, where all the famous Aston Martins from around the world have been built, all the DB4s and DB5s, and obviously Bond's car right. was, uh, was made here as well. Now, I met Paul. We had a, a good time in the green room yep. when we were doing the Phil and Holly show. Yep. That's right. And you brought all those toys to bear. Yeah. And you were so generous enough. You said, you know something, if you're ever back in town, come out into the countryside mm. and come our way. Mm. And here we are today. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's great for you to be able to come here and actually see where, you know, the, the most famous car in the world actually was created. Unbelievable. Well, I will let you start the tour then. Okay. So I've got something a bit special to show you. So oh. just in this little room here, these are some of the prototype gadgets for our Goldfinger production car. These were actually built by Chris Corbold and his team, um, who obviously has worked on the last 15 Bond films. But these are early prototypes for the oil ejection system for the back of the car and uh, an early prototype for the machine guns as well. So you can see that the, what Chris did was a, um, a, a really good but slightly complex and something that obviously wouldn't package inside the back of a DB5. Right. So our engineering team then had to take these gadgets and uh, kind of scale them back a little bit and make them more modular so they fit into the car because we wanted the 25 Goldfinger cars to look like a standard DB5 from the outside but have all the gadgets inside. And the film cars are great as film cars, but obviously things like the gadgets, they can operate once, and then it'd have to take 30 minutes to reset them to do another take. That's fine, because obviously Daniel Craig can go and have a sit down and a cappuccino. Right. But of course, our customers, they want to be able to operate the gadgets again and again yes. and again. They have to have that repeatability. Right. So when we actually did all these gadgets for the car, we ran them through a 5,000 continuous cycle program to make sure they're robust enough for all our customers in the, in the field. So you can understand the level of Amazing. engineering that went into Goldfinger is, is, is actually way beyond the film cars right. um, because we have to have this robustness. And obviously it's got to drive like a DB5 as well. That's right. So the difference between a prop and being able to reset over hours versus exactly. a dinner party saying, you want to see it again? Exactly. And obviously with, for the film, they have multiple cars. Right. So the stunt cars do stunts, the, uh, the hero cars do the close-up shots, etc., etc. But But our Goldfinger cars have to do everything. So it has to look like a hero car, but also have all the gadgets built into it. So, Astounding. Yeah, it's a, it's, um, it's a really interesting uh, way that we went about engineering the whole program because it has to meet uh, the same quality standards that we have for a modern Aston Martin. Mm -hmm. So if you can imagine we're trying to we're trying to overlay the modern uh, quality ethos and the stands that we build a modern Aston Martin to, to a 1964 product. Oh and, and that becomes quite difficult and complex. What we're going to do now is go into um, the workshop, but I'm going to take you into our trim shop uh, because the trim is part of the whole Aston Martin story and the whole story behind the Bond continuation cars. So. <laughs> this is our main workshop. So this building was actually put up in the 1950s by Sir David Brown to service Aston Martins. And we've been servicing Aston Martins you know, all, the, all, all the way from 1955 right up to date. It's um, a very clean environment because we want to deliver a very high quality product to our customers. Mm. And whether it's a Goldfinger car or a service on a 177, we have to do that in the best possible environment. Right. So um, everything is, is about quality, customer care, cleanliness. Yeah, I was going to make mention that the, what you can't see, obviously, on film is how clean, even smells clean, quite frankly. Yeah, so, and uh, the code to the trim shop, of course, is 7007. 7007, yeah. yeah. So that might be my luggage, too. <laughs> it might we, we shouldn't say that on camera. Yeah, that's true. Just in case somebody at uh, Heathrow I know the decides editor. to. I oh, that's okay, then. So um, in the trim shop here, we trim exactly the same way as we would have done in the 1960s. So we trim in Connolly hide. So this type of, uh, of hide, the Vomol um, Connolly hide. And we take entire uh, hides from, a, from an animal. And then we actually uh, operate through the, through the backbone of the animal. So we get, if we're doing things like here, we've got two door panels for a DB5. 
we'd actually operate so that we have uh, mirror imaging. So one will come from the left-hand side of the backbone and one from the right-hand side of the backbone. So we get a, a continuous grain within the leather. It's really important because the grain on this type of leather is not embossed like it is on modern leather. Right. This is a really natural product, which is why it smells of leather and doesn't smell of glue or varnish or, or, or paint. Right. Um, and these are manufactured, or the leather's manufactured, by Connolly Brothers, the same company that did it in the 1960s. So we have a real authenticity. And even when you look kind of behind, you see we keep the original um, wooden panels, which have still got the, the VIN number, the chassis number of the car, that was written on it um, in, in the 1960s. So we can check the authenticity. So we take a door panel off. Obviously, this is 1432 is the, is the VIN number for this car. Um, and when we did the Goldfinger car, it's a pair of Goldfinger seats over there, we actually went back to the original manufacturers because there's a lot of ambiguity about what colour the leather was because mm. when you watch the film, it looks like it's black and in some of the it later does. films, it is black. But actually went back to Connolly's and said, what colour was the car? And we dug out the original swatch and they tanned the hide specifically for us for that car. So we know it's exactly the right colour. Is it black then or is it like No, it's grey. Oh, it's gray. dark grey. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. So everybody thinks, but if you look really carefully at Goldfinger, right. you see it isn't black, it's actually very dark grey. But of course it films up slightly differently. Unbelievable. So that's the kind of one of the small bits yeah. of detail that we go to in terms of making sure the Goldfinger car is as authentic as we, we can possibly but make I, it. I would imagine the owners demand that type of detail if they're investing yeah. in something like this. Yeah, and, and the level of detail we went to is, is, is way beyond we've done with any other product. I mean, we went into minute detail. Amazing. We also had thing thing called um, upstream quality control. So when a part arrives for Goldfinger, we actually uh, quality control check it. Ah, oh, there we go, oh, there's there the seat. Is. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. It's like, it's like you've heard there of it. There we go. So, yeah, I mean, let's just have a look. Let's just have a look. So that is actually the correct color um, for Goldfinger, which is the original gray. Absolutely beautiful. Mm. Smell in here. You can, you can smell the leather, can't you? Absolutely. Um, and, and that's because so these old fashioned uh, type leathers are, uh, they're not, dyed in the same way that modern leather is. Mm. So these leathers didn't have um, fire retardant properties or demisting properties, which the modern leathers have to have. But because it's authentic, you, it's, it's one of those um, things that sorts the senses. So when you open the door in a golfing car, you get that fantastic waft of, of leather rather than glues it's, and paint. It's untainted. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Yeah, exactly. But uh, yeah, that's a that is going into the next car, which we're building at the moment, and other parts of trim as well. So I'm going to go now into our, our body and chassis area. Hopefully there's not too much noise, because obviously being a, a body and chassis area, there's a lot of hammering and stuff that goes on. But it's really important to be able to show you this part, because it makes it real. Um, and the skills that we employ in manufacturing a Goldfinger car is exactly the same as we would have done in the 1960s. So in here, uh, in here we have um, both old and new DB5. So this car here is a DB5 Goldfinger car, and then there's an original DB5 down there as a V8 Vantage in the middle. But when you look at the the skill and the artistry in actually manufacturing an entire front end that you have here for a DB5, you can see it's all manufactured from uh, flat sheet aluminium that's been wheeled. It's a bit noisy, so apologies. I love it. And it's all welded together. So every bit is made on its own and then it's hand welded together. This isn't quite finished, so this still has to be filed and uh, finished before it's fitted to the car. So Morgan over here, we'll just have a look at how we wheel panels. So literally, we start off with flat sheet aluminium and an English wheel. So these English wheels that we use are, um, well, they're free war. So they date back to before the Second World War. So the chances are that this was probably used during the war to make a wing for a Spitfire or a Lancaster. They came here after that and we used this to basically bend aluminium. So Morgan here is working on uh, another section for the front end on a, 
on a DB5. And you can see how it's all made from, from these sections. I'm going to upset him now because it takes off his jig. So this is also an original 1964 jig for, for DB5. So the chances are that Sean Connery's DB5 front end probably came off of this jig. So when we make a new part for a car, we know it's dimensioned exactly the same as it was in 64. So you can see here how it's been wheeled and chased in all these chase points here so that it fits absolutely, you know, 100%. And then Morgan will make the next part that goes on to that and then they'll weld them all together and finish them with their files and dollies and hammers in order to um, create an entire front end. And it's about 400 hours just to make the front end on a DB5. So it's, uh, it's very skilled, very intensive the way that we, we go about this. So, Morgan, have you got any... Ah, oh, here we go. So you can, you can see the wheeling mark here. Oh yeah, that's right. So you see how it's wheeled to put that compound curve and it then wheeled this way as well. And then you have to kind of put the, what we call the throat part through. And the, the skill and the dedication that you have to go to to just create this bit alone is immense. Morgan, how long would it take you to make this bit alone? Uh, a day's work. That's a day's work. So eight hours just to make that bit. I've still got a long way to go on that. You're not finished on this uh, yet. It's still got to be, it'll be finished off like that one. Beautiful so far. But it is, it is amazing and it's a skill that you don't find in a lot of places. Which is why it's important for us that we have younger members of the team like Morgan, we've got a couple of apprentices that just joined us as well to um, transition the skills from some of the more senior members of the team right. to the more junior members of the team. Um, How so, long is it like an apprenticeship? Four years. Four years. Yeah, four years. And they won't, they won't touch an English wheel until year three. And even people who work on English wheel for maybe 20 years, they still learn. Every day they come in, they learn something new because it's, it's it's a continuous process of um, personal engagement and actually learning about it. So, it, yeah, and, and then here we have uh, a Goldfinger DB5. So, as you see, it's manufactured the same as a 1964 car. It's all made from flat sheet aluminium. The chassis is uh, all mild steel. When we talk about the superleggera structure, that's this tubular structure that supports all the body paddle. And amazingly, all the body panels are actually not bonded or, uh, or screwed on, they're all what we call clenched on. So all around here, what will happen is this aluminium edge gets turned over this steel edge, and that's what holds the body rigidly in place, which is exactly the same as in the 60s. We could have done it and just bonded them on, but that wouldn't have been authentic. So it would be 100% authentic with everything that we do. So it's really important. But we employ you know, a lot of these modern jigs to make sure that the aperture for the rear screen is absolutely correct and uh, the, the tolerance across the entire chassis when we manufacture a chassis is four millimeters which is minute so it's far far less than it would have been in the day and actually far less than a normal production car so we have a really tight tolerance because using this kind of technology we have to have everything that's really accurate so everything goes together correctly what we don't want to be doing is like they did in the 60s where every single car is slightly different from the other one. We try to kind of standardise as much right. as we can. Because we have better quality uh, jigs and technology available to us that they didn't have in the 1960s. Right. So I'm not saying that the cars in the 1960s weren't built well because they're built very, very well, but they're built to a 1960s standard. But I said earlier, when you try to then take the quality ethos and the quality standards for a modern car and overlay it on this, things like the door gapping, has to be as per a modern car and is not able, we don't allow that interpretation from the panel team to go, yeah, it's okay. Because you would have had one guy in the 1960s on this side of the car, another panel beat on the other side of the car, they may not even have spoken to each other, might not even like each other, and so one goes, yeah, mine's all right. But actually the gap on one side is different to the other, so we actually take away that, we standardise it, so you have a very rigid process to make sure the cars are 100% correct. Amazing. Beautiful. You, you now like start to understand why the cars are priced as they are. Oh, absolutely. Because yeah. it, it, it is an absolute work of art. And for customers to buy these cars new, 
it's a once in a lifetime opportunity mm -hmm. to have a brand new Goldfinger car built for you. Yeah, I mean, you can see that the, it's the time, it's the heritage. I love how you're melding modern and mm. traditional aspects mm. together to mm. get the best of it. But it's, there's no question that the amount that goes into this. Yeah, yeah. and it's, it's important to, you're right, in terms of how far modern do you go without actually compromising right. the, the originality of the car. So yeah. we, we walked a very, very fine line and had some very uh, forthright conversations about Ooh. how we should deliver this. Being the third car uh, in the continuation program, we were, we were pretty, pretty well uh, defined path of what we want to achieve and how we're going to deliver it. But there were times when you know, the, the engineering team said, you know, we can't deliver that. And we said, well, you have to find a way. Yeah. You, know, you just have to get around it and make it, make it work. I mean, to, to the point where the, the thickness of the aluminium that we use is exactly the same as we did in 1964. Yeah, we did not compromise on the aluminium. We, we could have gone for, you know, different types of material, but actually wanted to be 100% authentic. Love it. Oh. So that's just one, one part. We'll go into paint, because paint's another sure. really interesting part of, uh, of the whole DB5 Goldfinger story as well. And we're fortunate that we do all this in-house. So everything that's on this car amazing. we do in-house. You know, we, we don't... You we, don't farm this out? No, we don't farm this out. No, Please. it's all in-house. Um, and that enables us to A, um, not compromise on quality, because mm -hmm. we own the quality within the business. And as you've seen, it enables us to also to invest in the people, to really um, move the skills on, uh, so that we have this new, yeah. You can smell the paint. So you can't smell this uh, out through the camera, but you have that fresh, wonderful, but not acidic paint smell, I like it. It's a wonderful environment here. We have two light inspection booths where we do our, our uh, inspection of uh, the final quality of the paint and our polishing process as well. Um, and uh, this part of the business, when we were really in full production on Goldfinger cars, uh, worked 24 seven. So oh literally we never shut. We had three shifts working here, um, painting cars continuously because it was, at that point we were, we were building so many cars. How many but, did you build at the continuation? So there's 25 cars in total. Okay. We, we, we're almost finished. We're almost finished. We've uh, literally, that's the, the last car that we're just showing you now. Um, but the color is something that's quite interesting mm. as well. So Aston Martin, um, as you know, the car we loaned them was a press car, which was red, and they didn't like that color. We had a color that was called Snow Shadow Grey, which is very similar to uh, Silver Birch, but not as heavy metallic. So the Silver Birch color was actually um, designed by the, the team at, uh, at Eon Productions. Oh. So that was the color that they chose for the car. And um, when we went to do Goldfinger, the silver birch color uh, had been interpreted or misinterpreted over the years so many times that when we went to our archive here and we got out silver birch, we kind of got out about 14 different varieties of silver birch and then we went, which one's the right one? So we kind of scratched our heads. And fortunately, ICI have got a heritage department and they had the original swatch from 1964. And so we reformulated, put through a mass spectrometer, we reformulated modern paint. So we know that the color that we use is exactly the same as the original car. Oh so again, small detail, but uh, they're cumulative though. They are. They add up. They will add up. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. and delivers an outstanding product because of that. How important is, is it to the customers buying these that, to your point earlier, everything is done in house? It has to be under this roof. It's massively important. Yeah. You know, you, you can't underestimate Aston Martin works at Newport Pagnell. We've been here since 1955. We are the factory where those cars were originally manufactured. Um, you, you can't underestimate the level of provenance and authenticity that comes through that. I mean, some of these guys here, you know, their fathers or grandfathers will have worked on the production line for DB5. So we have that kind of lineage going through. I mean, this actual site predates Aston Martin. I mean, we used to build horse-drawn carriages here in the 1850s. There's probably no other site in the world that can trace their lineage yeah. right back to, to the 18th, before the internal combustion engine. So there was horsepower, but now there's horsepower. Now there is horsepower, yeah. 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 That's like a tagline, you can use that. <laughs> so yeah, it's a, and it's, um, it's a business that continually evolves. I mean, you may have noticed we've now got LED lighting in, in mm -hmm. the business. So 
from an environmental perspective, we're always looking at the environment and the ways to make things more efficient. So we, if you come here in three weeks' time, we'll have uh, solar panels on all the roofs. Oh, wow. So we're going to produce about 30% of our electricity consumption will come through renewables. We're then looking into having a wind turbine uh, off-site. And uh, we, we do a huge amount in terms of uh, making sure our energy consumption is as low as possible. I just got a huge smile as I came into this room. Is yeah. that normal? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. So this is our heritage department. Wow. So in here we do everything from a routine service on a DB5 through to a full restoration and everything in between, quite literally. So you'll find in here um, we have got, well, I mean, DB4, DB6, V8 Zagato, Virage V8, uh, V8 Coupe two Goldfinger cars which have come back for customers for servicing, um, cars being restored, uh, DB5 Goldfinger down the bottom there. It's a, it's, it's as close to Q's Ladin as you'll, uh, it, you'll, it, you'll find. It's, that's exactly what it feels yeah. like. It feels like, you know, when he gets, goes from his Bentley and he says, you know, where's my Bentley? It never failed me. And, Hugh brings it out. You would imagine below them, yep. they were having this type of a situation yep. where they're loading everything up. And of course, That's what it feels like. the other thing that nobody really under, knows about is that on Her Majesty's Secret Service, there's a sequence in the film, which was filmed actually here, in this building, actually in the corner there. Oh, is so, that right? Yeah, where you see the DBS for the first time. That's oh. actually filmed here on site. So uh, it's about, I think it's the only time that an Aston Martin facility has ever appeared in a in a Bond film, so there you go. This is a Bond location, it's a, a movie location. It's a proper Bond location, right exactly. Right here. Right here, this is where it happened. Um, and we've got a Goldfinger car down the bottom, which is a oh. finished car that we can, we can have a look around and, uh, and show you. This car is a fully finished, so from here, it looks like a standard DB5, apart from obviously we've got BMT 216A, which is a bit of a giveaway, uh, the registration number, probably the most famous registration number in the entire world. Um, and this car's now finished, ready uh, to, to, uh, to be delivered. Um, we also have developed for the car a high capacity uh, power pack because a lot of these cars now are housed in people's entrance halls and dining rooms and things like that, where actually they just want to play with the gadgets all the time. Yeah, people do drive this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, we deliver it as a non-road compliant car. Um, but there are a number of companies around the world that will then convert them to, to road specification as well. Uh, our engineering cars are, are road registered. And in fact, the sister car to this car, I was driving back from um, one of our engineering centers and I stopped at uh, a petrol pump. Quite a funny story. So I, I stopped at a petrol <laughs> pump to fill the car with fuel because typically with engineers, they always leave me with a car with no fuel in it. So I had to stop at uh, a petrol pump and I was filling the car up with, uh, with fuel and a guy that came along who obviously uh, was a bit down on his luck, had a couple of, uh, all his possessions in a couple of uh, carrier bags and uh, came over to me and I thought, oh dear, he's going to ask me for some money. Um, and he came up to me, he looked at the front of the car and he turned around and said, is this one of these Goldfinger DB5s I've heard about? <laughs> and I, but it's amazing the... Uh, the love and affection there is for this car, wherever you go in the world, yeah. you know, everyone lets you out at a junction, everyone wants to be your friend, everyone wants to come and talk to you mm -hmm. because it's just that kind of car. Everybody wants a bit of ownership of, of DB5 Goldfinger. And I'm so pleased we're able to build 25 of these cars and allow people to kind of have their own Bond car that they can park in their garage. And, and yeah, I've been in cinemas, I think the one with Daniel Craig where it comes up in the lift and or he takes the cover off the car, and there was a round of applause for the car, mm -hmm. which I was like humbled by. Yeah. Uh, and, and you know, I hate to say it, but the last sequence uh, in the most recent film, where you see the V8 driving away, even I was a bit, a bit choked at that oh, point absolutely. in time because it's such a, it's such a moment, and the cars are such a big part of Bond's life. They are. You know, I mean, we always say we're not the James Bond car company, but without James Bond, where would Aston Martin be? And mm. conversely, without Aston Martin. Where would James Bond be? That's because right. the two things are so kind of interconnected mm -hmm. that you, you can never break it. And when you try and do a Bond film without an Aston Martin, it's not quite the same. And there's a great part in the movie Skyfall to show the connection between Bond and his car, like we have mm -hmm. connections with our cars, 
where literally he's fine, he's yeah. not that angry until they blow up his car. Yeah. And then the music starts and he gets angry. Yeah. And I love that moment because I, I have an Aston Martin, I have a Vantage. Really? And I, I'm so emotionally connected. Yeah. I never want to say that about things. Yeah. You don't want to be that yeah. type of person. Yeah. But there is something, a relationship, I'll call it, between you and your car when you have something like this. Yeah. glory absolutely fully finished ready to go okay so what are we holding right here so this is one thing that bond didn't have which is a remote control for his db5 oh my goodness now we're very conscious that our customers will want to kind of see all the gadgets working which you can't do when you're actually sat in the car right so we come up with this ingenious device so this allows us to operate you must be joking i had to say that <laughs> sorry i never joke about my work bond oh perfect <laughs> <laughs> machine guns deployed okay so when I press the red button, Jeez. you get the LED flash, and obviously the noise, which again is lifted from Goldfinger again, it's, uh, it's actually better inside than out, because actually you get a much bigger reverberation inside a building than you do outside. And uh, just to retract the guns, and they retract, and of course then the indicators have to work as an indicator That's right. for a normal car. Oh my gosh. So again, engineering this, so we showed you the prototype, that Chris did mm -hmm. for the car, but this is the productionized version that fits inside the very small wheel well here and it allows us to have the, uh, the machine gun that deploys and retracts within the wheel arch. Amazing. And again, in the 1964 car that had the original guns, the car that used for that, the, the front wheels would only move five degrees off the center. So you couldn't actually drive it on the road. I love it. Uh, what we also have are the front rams, which were never actually deployed during the uh, during the film, uh, but the rams come out quite useful for parking in Paris, <laughs> and then uh, retract back in. I work in New York City too. Might work in New York as well. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. And then, you know, what Bond car wouldn't be complete without having the revolving number plates? Well, we have even the, the sound. Yeah, it's a really technical servo sound. Yes. So it sounds like it like it should do. So we have the Swiss registration plate, the French registration plate as used in the films, and of course, BMT 216A, the most famous registration plate in the world. Um, Amazing. And to the rear of the car, All right. naturally we have the bullet resistant shield. We say it bullet resistant rather than bulletproof. This is actually made from carbon Kevlar and we fired small arms fire at it to make sure it does actually stop. You did not. We did, absolutely. I'm always serious about my work. That's, I'm, I'm gonna pay you a compliment. It's wonderfully bonkers. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> because somebody is gonna use that at a dinner party yeah. who owns this and say, this isn't just you know, a, a fiberglass shield. No, 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 it's not. No, no, it's proper carbon Kevlar. It, it's, it's bullet resistant material. And we want it to be such. We want it to be as authentic as possible. And so, again, the way that it operates, the one on the car in the film doesn't operate and like I love this. how it's so beautifully yep. flush. Yeah. Like everything is just perfect. The engineers, when they built this part, this was one of the most difficult parts was to get it to fit flush and operate time and time again. It actually operates on a 24 volt system. So there are two different battery systems in the car to operate all the different systems. So it's, it's quite a, a fun thing. So to deploy the oil slick, which isn't oil, it's actually water. And you can understand why now I said, don't stand behind the car, please. That's so that's quite funky. Oh my gosh. And then obviously 
when they retract back inside the car, the indicators again have to operate like a standard uh, indicator. But smoke is epic on this car. So we have two smoke machines, one in the corner of each part of the boot. Even on a day where there's lots of wind like it is today, you can see that we can create the most enormous amounts of smoke. And in fact, I think it's much better than the car that was used in the film. And of course, you've got rams on the rear as well. Coming and going. Exactly. Amazing. So. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah, and it's, it's just fun to be able to operate it from here. Obviously, the center console is exactly the same as was in the film. And when you lift the uh, gear stick top up, there's a red button there. And that does exactly the same as the red fire button does on the remote. So everything that you select on the center console in terms of what you want to deploy is then fired or activated on the red button on the top of the gear stick. Oh so when I turn this off, now the master control is the center console in the car. So that's now redundant but it does charge wirelessly when it's sat in its So the center the console, car. everything that you just did, you can do now Absolutely. from there. Yep. I love yep. it. Yep. So you can deploy every gadget from the center console, exactly the same as you did in the film. The only difference being, in the film, the red button on top of the gear stick only mm. fired the ejector seat. We decided that actually, we would make the red button then operate whatever gadget is selected on the center console, whether it's guns, smoke, uh, oil slick, we just did the whole whole thing through there. Ah. Okay, well, I am now sitting inside this amazing DB5, and I have to tell you, it's very comfortable. You've got, you know, the wood steering wheel here. You've got everything that, again, none of this would have changed. This is what the one from Goldfinger would have looked like from the wiper to the temperature. And of course, you've got the control panel, um, oil slick, rear smoke, front ram, rear ram, front guns, roof hatch, it's all there. One of my favorite pieces, of course, has gotta be this. With a flick of a thumb, and this is magnetic, you've got the switch, you've got the little depression button, and that's incredibly satisfying to press that. The smell that I am smelling right now is so beautiful. Uh, yeah, it, this is kind of a dream come true just to sit in it. So it, it's an amazing car. It's an amazing process. Paul, thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. Love I do have a you. question, though, because yes. you were so enthusiastic in here. You could see it, the passion and everything like yeah. this. I'm going to ask you a question I think I know the answer to. Do you love what you do? It's the best job in the world. I mean, you know, it is by far the best job in the world, and they pay me to do this. Things like this kind of car. I had a dinky toy when I was a child. And to be able to produce this car as a full-size you know, toy, right. it's just so much fun. Yeah, it's a great job. Best job in the world. Wouldn't well, do anything else. Not to use the pun, but uh, thank you for taking us on the ride. I appreciate it. And this is an amazing place. We'll leave some links down below because there's a lot to be told. Story is not ending. And sometimes when you own one of these cars, the story can be yours as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Yeah. Paul, thank you so much. No problem. In nice the meantime, you. this has been David Zaritsky for The Bond Experience. We'll see you all real soon. Take care.
Thanks for watching this episode. If you want to be up on the latest from the Bond experience, just click on this subscribe and subscribe to our channel. You're going to get all the latest and greatest information plus some exclusive content. And by the way, speaking of content, here's something especially for you just because we know you. Talk to you soon.